Good morning. Good morning, good morning. It's good to see you all. Would you stand with us, please? And we will pray and, <clears throat> excuse me, we will pray this morning and begin worship together. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for a brand new day that we get to, to stand in your presence and that we get to experience your grace and your mercy and your fellowship and your love for us. We thank you so much that you have given us the great ability and, and privilege of being your children and that you love us so much. We pray that you'll be glorified in our words today, in our songs, in our um, fellowship, in our prayer, and through the message, through your word. We pray that you will be glorified in all of it. We ask in the name of Jesus. And everyone said... Amen. Let's sing this together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Oh, Our greater debtor, and oh, to grace a greater debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. I'm prone to That you're pleased. 
peace and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. sing the voices. for being perfect. Thank you for being a God that we can trust and love and worship. We praise you for it. Thank you for your word this morning. We pray that you will speak through Pastor Jason as he comes to share your word this morning and help us to become more like you today through the teaching and preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, good morning. If you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, you can begin turning to Luke chapter 12. Before, I mean, Genesis chapter 12, <laughs> my bad, don't know where Luke came from, but Genesis chapter 12 is where we'll be, the first book of the Bible there, all right, Genesis chapter 12. As, um, you know, as, as, you know, this weekend was a, uh, just one of those unique weekends, and so this morning I was 
skimming through the book of Revelation and it is confirmed. On a weekend in which Tennessee wins and Alabama loses is the beginning of the apocalypse. <laughs> and it has begun. But, but we're not going to talk about such things this morning. But some, sometimes in life there's things that happen that make sense. And then sometimes there's things in life that don't make sense. Some things that bring us joy. Some, of us, some things that bring us grief. Some things we can make sense of. Some things we can't make sense of. Life just kind of has a way of happening, and whether we want it to or not, it just kind of happens. And we live in a broken and fallen world, so a lot of times, because of today's culture and us having 24-hour news cycles now, it just seems like negative news is always before us. We're seeing the worst of the world all the time. And one of the things I often hear or am asked is like, Hey, don't you think the world is getting so, it's so much worse than it was even 30 years ago? I'm like, well, technically no, because we just have more access to information now than we did before. See, all this stuff has been going on for centuries and centuries. For thousands of years, we just didn't know about it because out of sight, out of mind. One of those things that people have a hard time with, you know your child was more likely to get abducted in the 70s than they are today. Now, in the 70s, you just didn't hear about it all the time. But now, every time there's an Amber Alert, it alerts our phones and things like that. We're just more aware of those things. And sometimes life can be very difficult. And when life is difficult, it becomes difficult to hear God's calling or to recognize God's calling on your life. Because you get caught up in life, in the busyness, in the hustle and bustle, the ups and downs, and we forget that God has called us to be his servants. God has called us to live a life for his glory. And sometimes we get distracted by all that's going on in the world and we forget our calling. And yes, everyone's calling is to live a life for the glory of God, wherever that may be. Now that fleshes itself out very differently for different people. We have some believers that, you know, they, they move to Africa and they plant churches. We got some who go to Asia. We have some who go to the Indian reservations out west. We have some that go to the outer skirts of Alaska. We have some who go in, you know, down into the parts of Florida or Hawaii or wherever it may be. We have people that are called to different locations, but they're all called to do the same thing. Bring glory to God in wherever they are and whatever they are doing. So just as much as a call of a missionary who's planting churches in Asia is called to glorify God with every aspect of the life, you and I, who are living here in Franklin County in the area, are called just as much to glorify God in everything that we do as that missionary. Because technically speaking, every believer is a missionary. Every believer is not living at home. Our home is not here. We are aliens. We are foreigners. Our kingdom is not of this world. Thus, we are all on mission to make much of God and proclaim the gospel. So this morning we're going to look at Genesis 12. We're going to look at Abram, the, the call of Abram when God comes and he calls Abram. So we're going to start with verses 1 through 3 of Genesis chapter 12. It said, the Lord said to Abram, go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All right, so Abram which will later become Abraham, is the next major character in the redemption story. Uh, God has chosen to give us the stories of Adam and Seth and Enoch, Noah, and now Abraham. 
So why these particular people in the Old Testament? Why don't we get stories of other people? Where's the stories of Cain's line? Where's the stories of Japheth's line? Where's the stories of Ham's lines? The reason we don't get those is because all of the Bible is about Jesus. And so these, the stories we get in the Old Testament are directly related to the lineage and the call and the coming of Jesus. And so that's why we get the story of Abraham and maybe not the stories of Abraham's brothers or his father. It's because Abraham is the one picking up in that story that helps us focus on Jesus. We saw earlier that Enoch in Genesis 5.22 walked with God. We saw Noah in Genesis 6.9 walked with God. And now we're going to see in Genesis 12.8, which we're going to read in a little bit, that Abraham begins calling on the name of God. And so we see here in Abraham's call here by God, there is a promise that is made. And the promise is going to make him into a great nation. And we also see another messianic prophecy. In verse 3, it says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the people on earth will be blessed through you. Again, that's pointing to the lineage of Jesus. All the people will be blessed through Jesus. So here again, we see another prophecy about Jesus. The Old Testament is littered with them. There's so many prophecies, so many promises God is making about the Messiah, the Son of God, who will come. And here we see it again. Through the lineage that we're going to trace through Abraham all the way up to when we get to Matthew 1. We're seeing that God is faithful to his promise that he made originally in Genesis 3.15. When he promised the seed who will crush the head of the serpent. And we see this, that promise of Genesis 3.15 is echoed over and over and over again all throughout the Old Testament. So the seed is promised and then we're going to watch the seed's lineage all the way up until Jesus through the Old Testament. And we see that the promise is made that all the nations will be blessed through Abraham, which is pointing them to Jesus. So picking up in Abram's story, verse 4 through 6 of Genesis 12. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took with his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions that had he, they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out. For the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land of the site of Shechem and an oak of Morah, and that time the Canaanites were in the land. So God called, told Abram, Get up and go to the land that I will show you. Abraham immediately responded to the call of God by faith. He trusted, God's called me, so I am going to. To go. If you remember in the book of James, if you flip to the New Testament in the book of James, James talks about like you could say you have faith all day, but I'll show you my faith by my works. So Abraham not only trusted God, but he acted upon it, which proved he had faith. Faith is trust in action, which means if faith is not producing any action, it's not real faith. So faith is trust in action. And we see here that he trusted God's calling and so he acted. He, by faith he left and just started roaming the land. And Abram was completely unaware of God, where, where God was leading him. But see, it didn't seem to matter at this point. What mattered was the obedience to the call of God. Look, if I'm obedient, God will take care of the details. That's where we should be as believers. I'll be obedient to what God has called me to do, and He will take care of the details. And then you just step out in faith and trust that God's word is true. Now in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 through 10, we get a little bit more, little bit more insight into the call of Abraham. In Hebrews 11, 8 through 10, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed, and set out for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. 
See, Abraham wasn't even just simply looking for a place here on earth. He was looking forward to the promised city of God. Abraham, at this point, Abram, was eternally minded. He understood everything in this life was temporary, and earth ultimately was not his home. He understood that because he was longing for the new heavens and the new earth. He was longing for that time in which God would sit down with his people. One thing we got to remember, though, in this story is the importance and the value of God's word. God spoke. Abram obeyed. Reminds me of that, that hymn, Trust and Obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Obedience is one of those words that I feel like is fleeting from the Christian life. We don't talk a lot about obedience and how we're called to obey. We're called to be slaves of Christ. We're called to be servants of God. That we are not the captain of our own ships. We are not making our own way. When we are saved, we become servants of the King of Kings. And we do His bidding. Not our own. We give up our lives. And we give our lives to Him. And give Him complete and utter control. And what He says goes. We don't call the shots. He calls the shots, and we live a life of obedience. But I want us to talk for just a moment about the importance of the Word of God in our life. Because at this point, God's Word came to Abram, and he responded. Now, that just doesn't happen overnight. All right? You're just not going to wake up one day and just see God's Word and just obey it. That comes from a lifetime of, hey, I am trusting in the Lord and as your trust in him grows as you're reading his word more and more and trusting his word it builds into those moments see Abram Abram was 75 before God finally called him out that means he was in training and being preparing for this moment for 75 years that means a a couple things that we can kind of take off of that. One, if you're around 75 years old, God's been preparing your whole life for what's next. Because God doesn't finish, is not finished with you at a certain age. It's not like there's a retirement plan with God. Be like, okay, well, you've hit this age. You're retired now from kingdom work. Just, you know, wait until you go home. No, no, no. God is not done with you at all. There's things that God is preparing for you. You've been preparing your whole life for a call that God is going to put on your life up until the day you die. It also says there was preparation there. It teaches that Abram was faithful to God for a long time and that God is able to step him out. So the importance of God's word. If you want to know the importance of God's word, I encourage you to read Psalm 119. It just read the whole thing. And I know it's, it's long, it's the longest chapter in the Bible, but it's really, really good. And I'm just going to point out a few verses at the beginning of Psalm 119 to talk about the importance of God's Word. Psalm 119, verse 1 and 2, it says, How happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk according to the Lord's instruction, according to the Lord, God's Word. Verse 2, happy are those who keep his decrees and seek him with all of the heart. Keep his decrees, keep his words and commands. Verse 9, how can a young man keep his ways pure? By keeping your word. Verse 14, I rejoice in the way revealed by your decrees as much as in all riches. He's saying God's commands are better than all the riches of this world. In verse 18, open my eyes so that I may contemplate wondrous things from your instructions, from your commands. There's wondrous, wondrous things in the commands of God. In verse 23, though... Princes sit together speaking against me. Your servant will think about this, your statutes. Your decrees are my delight and my counselors. Where does, where does the man of God go for counsel, for insight? The word of God, his commands. Verse 27, help me understand the meaning of your precepts so that I can meditate on your wonders. How do we know about the wonders of God? Through his word. Verse 28, I am weary from grief. Strengthen me through your word. When you're weary, when you're full of grief, where do you turn? Where do you find comfort and peace and strength? From the word of God. 
Verse 34, help me understand your instruction and I will obey it and follow it with all of my heart. Verse 37, turn my eyes from looking at what is worthless. Give me life in your ways. God, life, the, the abundant life that you want to have is found in the word of God and following his commands. Verse 38, confirm what you have said to your servant for it produces reverence for you. You want to love God more, you want to respect him more, you want to be in awe of him more, read his word and his commands. Verse 40, how I long for your precepts, give me life through your righteousness. How do you have life through the righteousness of God and you learn of that through his word? See, the word of God has played an integral role in the life of Abram. And we see the importance and the value of God's word that comes to us. And then we pick up in his story. In verse 7 through 9 of Genesis 12, he's heard the word of God, he's responded. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. For there he moved on to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on his west and I on his east, he built an altar to the Lord there. And he called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram journeyed by stages to Negev. Abram's response to God was worship. He built an altar and he called on the name of the Lord. Called on the name of the Lord. That implies a personal relationship. Abram knew the Lord. He knew him by name, so much so that he could talk to him. He could call upon him. Now, with our day and age, with internet and all that kind of stuff, I can learn a lot of things about a lot of different people. I can know a lot of things about Michael Jordan. But I don't know him. There's a difference in knowing about someone and then knowing them personally. Big difference. And here this speaks to Abram personally knowing God. He called him by name. See, salvation is about, is about a relationship. That's the whole point of the gospel. It's so that we may be right before God, that we may have a relationship, a personal relationship with our Heavenly Father. Any other thoughts about the gospel are wrong. The purpose of the gospel is so that you may have a personal relationship with your Heavenly Father. It's not about a place. It's not about a location. It's not about getting something. It is about having a personal relationship with your Creator, with the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. It is about a relationship. The gospel is given to us so that we may call on the Lord by name. So we may know him personally and intimately. We see that being the purpose of the gospel when Paul explains it in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 through 4. Now he speaks of how Christ came and he died according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose on the third day according to the scriptures. All the scriptures were pointing to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus so that may be restored, so that we may call on the name of the Lord. So we may know him and abide with him. In John chapter 15, Jesus speaks of this even more in verses 1 through 10. So John 15, beginning in verse 1, it says, I, Jesus is speaking. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you, just as the branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine. Neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit, because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch, and he withers. They gather them, throw them into, into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want, it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. 
As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Again, it's all about relationship. And what was the key to that relationship? Obeying his commands. Obeying the word of God. The word of God is the key to it all. You want to have a vibrant relationship with your Heavenly Father? It begins and ends with the Word of God. You want to know who God is? It begins and ends with the Word of God. You want to live for the glory of God? It begins and ends with the Word of God. You cannot live as a believer faithfully without the Word of God. It is impossible. Because how are you supposed to obey if you have no idea what to obey? Even in Psalm 119, we read, I meditate on your word day and night. God's word is described in Psalm 119 as a treasure, as wonderful, as something to be valued more than all the riches of the world. God's word is of great value. I fear As believers in America, we have devalued the Word of God because we have it everywhere. You have apps on your phone. There's Bibles, you know, thankfully, through the Gideon ministry, there's Bibles in hotel rooms, there's Bibles in hospitals, there's Bibles in schools, places, there's Bibles. we We have an overabundance of Bibles in our country. Yet we are, the mo- we are one of the most biblically illiterate generations to ever walk the earth. I remember being on a mission trip in Africa. We were in Mozambique, and we went out to this remote village outside the city. And we were going out there. As we were going out there, and we're getting closer, the missionaries were taking us out there. All of a sudden, we hear this big bell ringing. And we're like, what is that? And we asked, what are they doing? It's like, well, they saw the missionaries. They saw us coming. And all the believers are coming from the fields to come and to hear the word of God. Because they did not have a Bible in their language. And even if they did have a Bible in their language, they couldn't read it because they were illiterate and they didn't have school. Now, in that area, food was very scarce. They had, Mozambique had went through an 11-year civil war, destroyed everything infrastructure-wise. They had nothing to eat. The only way you could eat one meal, one small meal was to work all day. And then you'd be given one small meal. All the believers in that area gave up their one small meal for that day because they got to hear the word of God. They valued and they understood the importance of the word of God. I'm afraid that there's... there's we wouldn't give up hardly anything. I mean, we wouldn't give up anything for the Bible, I don't feel like. I think that's proven in our actions. If you're not reading the Bible every day, it shows that you're unwilling to give up anything for the Bible. And what makes you think when persecution comes that you would give up all this world has to offer for the glory of God? See, Abram had been preparing for the moment. It's much like sports. You practice and you practice and you practice before you go to the game. Why do you practice? Because if you just show up at the game, you're going to do terrible. You need to practice. The Bible is clear. The world will hate us. Persecution is unavoidable. It is coming. Yes, even to the United States. We've read the Bible. We've got the end. We we know what happens at the end. Worldwide persecution like the world has never seen is going to break out. We can't stop it. We can't change it. We can't slow it down. It's coming. And it could be here tomorrow. Are you practicing for the moment that God is going to call you? Are you preparing? Abram had been preparing for the moment that God would call him out. If you're not preparing when God calls, you're going to miss it. And you're going to miss out. T. 
to piggyback on Hebrews 11.10, where we read earlier. And it says that Abraham was longing and looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. We see that a little bit more revealed in Revelation 22, verse 1 through 5. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the city's main street, the tree of life, which is on each side of the river, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for he the healing of the nations, and there will no longer, no longer be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. People will not need the lamp of a light or the light of the sun because the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Abraham was longing for that day. But as he longed for that day, he was preparing for the call of God. But there's a brutal reality in life. We can prepare and prepare and prepare. But we are still just men and women. Abram had prepared. God called. He instantly obeyed. And he went out. And then the first sign of trouble. We see how he responds. Verse 10 through 20 of Genesis 12, it says, There was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to stay there for a while because the famine in the land was severe. Side note right there. Did God tell him to go? Or he just went because he looked at it and decided. Verse 11. When he, had, when he was about to, to, about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarah, Look, I know that you are a beautiful woman, when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. They will kill me, but let you live. Please say, You're my sister, so it will go well for me because of you, and my life will be spared on your account. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh. So the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well because of her, and Abram acquired flocks and herds, male and female donkeys, male and female slaves and camels. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his household with severe plagues because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh sent for Abram and said, What have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? So that I look, so I look her, took her as my own wife. Now, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave his men orders about him, and they sent him away with his wife and all he had. Here we see Abram falling short. He messes up. What was the beginning of his mess up? It almost perfectly parallels David's mess up as well. See, if you remember the story of David, it said, David, in the time of year when the kings were at battle with his people, David was at his palace. So he made one decision. He said, I'm not going to obey. I'm going to do my own thing. And so he goes to do his own thing, and then it snowballs on David to the point where he murders one of his best friends, takes his, takes his wife, and all those things. Then you see Abram here. Abram was supposed to stay in the land that God had promised him. But he looked around, and he saw the famine, and he, said, and he thought with his own personal intellect and his own understanding, hey, I can reason that there's a famine in this land. I can reason it's better for me to go to Egypt. Did God call him to Egypt? No. God called him to the promised land. See, that's the danger. When we take our own initiative and our own understanding of things and we place that above the word of God, it gets us in trouble every single time without exception. And then it snowballs. Then he lies. And then plagues come on Pharaoh and his household and his servants. 
We must be careful. Temptation is everywhere. We're seeing it. We saw it with Noah. Look, remember Noah's story. He was righteous. He walked with God. God calls Noah, build this ark. Noah responds and builds the ark. God makes a promise with Noah. Noah gets drunk and things fall apart and people are cursed. Then we see Abram. Righteous. Calls on the name of the Lord. God calls him. Abraham responds and then he lies. Temptation is a reality in the world in which we live. The enemy will constantly be tempting us. So how do we respond to temptation? How can we fight against temptation? The word of God. See, if Abram in that moment, there's a severe famine in the land. If Abram went back and said, but the Lord has called me here. His word said, go here. If Abram would have trusted that, he wouldn't have ended up in Egypt, and he wouldn't have lied, and there wouldn't have been plagues brought on Pharaoh and his family, and there wouldn't have been that problem if he would have just listened to the word of God rather than making his own way or using his own reasoning. The word of God is key to facing in any temptation. You remember Jesus in the wilderness when Jesus went out of the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights and he was tempted by Satan, every time Satan tempted him, Jesus responded with the Word of God. All three times with the Word of God. And see, after the first two times, Satan picked up on it. And so the third temptation, Satan came at him with the Word of God, but out of context. But Jesus put God's Word back in its proper context and sent Satan away. God's word is key. That's why the psalmist says in 119, meditate upon the word of God day and night so that I may not sin against you. We must meditate. If you go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 20, you read about the putting on the full armor of God. There is only one offensive weapon that we are given in the armor, and it is the word of God. It is the only way for us to battle temptation. It is the only way for us to know God. It is the only way for us to live a life for the glory of God is the word of God that he has given us. Because we see when we read through all of this word, it's pointing us to Jesus. Why is all of the word pointing us to Jesus? Because it's all about a relationship. That's why the word of God is so important. Because the closer you walk with the Lord, the further you walk away from the world. And we're going to see that Abram, who had become Abraham, again is picturing Christ, is pointing people to Jesus. Abram was a man who was to build a great nation, but Jesus will build a greater nation. Abraham was promised to be blessed and have his enemies cursed. Jesus' enemies will become his footstool. Abram knew God by name. Jesus is one with the Father and the Spirit. Abram would sin when driven to the wilderness. Jesus was sinless in the wilderness. While Abraham became a father of the nation of Israel, even that nation, people are left wanting. But see, Jesus is going to establish an eternal kingdom in which all his people would be completely and utterly satisfied. Jesus is the better Abraham. Jesus is the better kingdom builder. Jesus is the better covenant. We see even Abraham was longing for the day that he would see the city of God that was built by God himself. Why was he longing for that day? Not because he'd get to walk on streets of gold, not because of the pearly gates, none of that. It was because they will see his face. It is all about that relationship. That is the central theme of the gospel, of the whole word of God, is relationship. So the question is, 
Do you have a relationship with the Lord? Do you know Him by name? Or do you just know about Him? Or do you know Him personally? See, Abram was able to call on Him by name. Now, Abram still struggled with life. Temptation come, he used his own reason, he departed. But what would bring Abraham back? Submitting again to the Word of God. Life is going to be full of ups and downs. Just because you become a believer and you give your life to Christ doesn't mean it's rainbows and sunshines all your days. We still live in a broken, fallen world. But, that's be, but knowing that, God has given us His Word so that we can navigate this life. So that we can begin, not waiting till one day in heaven to serve Him, but we can serve Him and glorify Him now. This is a great time to be practicing for when the time comes when we'll stand before his face. And the gospel is simple. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The reason the gospel is simple is that the gospel is God saving us. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to be good enough. You don't have to get to a certain level to be able to be saved. It doesn't matter where you at, what you've done, where you are in your life. Right now, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you can be saved. You can be cleansed. As 1 John 1, 9 says, if you, if you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Even in Matthew 1, if you read the genealogy of Jesus, you will see prostitutes, murderers, and all in between. God's grace is sufficient. That's where you turn, is to the grace of God. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not might, not hope so, will be. Because it is God who's going to save you. Not your goodness. Not your abilities. Rest in the word of God. Not in your own understanding. Let's pray. Father, we want to come to you in this moment. And we first want to praise you and thank you for the grace and the love that you've given us in Christ that we can know you by name. That we can worship you in truth and in spirit and that we can be your servants. That we can serve the King of kings, Lord of lords, the creator and sustainer of all life. The gospel is such just good, good news. But Father, we ask that you help us to be a people who are zealous for your word. Because in it is how we know you. It's where we find comfort and peace. Because all of your word is pointing us to Jesus. Father, if there's anyone here today who has never surrendered their life to you, we pray that today will be a day of salvation for them. That they would cry out. That they would confess that Jesus is Lord. And that they would believe in their hearts that, you, that God, you rose him from the dead on the third day. Holy Spirit, we ask that you just bring great conviction upon them. Father, for those who are believers here today and we have not been faithful in reading your word and meditating upon it and seeking to know you more, Holy Spirit, we ask you to bring great conviction to where we can't go a day without knowing more about you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the very neat things about the word of God and as we read it all, and we see it all, and it's all pointing to Jesus, we see that in John 
chapter 1, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word is always going to be pointing you to a relationship. We follow the Word of God so that we can more closely walk with our Heavenly Father. And I pray that that will be your great desire to walk with Him because there's going to be a moment when God calls you to step out by faith. And if you haven't been reading the Word, you will fail. You will not heed the call. You will stumble. You will fall. No other way. You can't expect to be obedient to, the, to God's calling if you're actually not reading His commands, His Word. And my great prayer for our church is that we be a church, a people who love and value and embrace the Word of God fully and completely. Now this time we're going to stand and we're going to sing because God is worthy of worship. And uh, we're just going to, we're going to praise Him. I encourage you, don't leave this place until you've settled in your heart to surrender to the call of the Lord, to know Him. Read His Word. Meditate on it. Learn it. Live it. Let's stand and let's sing. When I need a quiet space To rest in grace A hiding place there That's haunting me when I'm at the end of me. 